The result of the division is ayes 84, noes 54. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. Clark. Second readings. A bill for an act to repeal the Clean Energy Act 2011 and for other purposes. A bill for an act to amend the Ozone Protection and Synthetic Greenhouse Gas Import Levy Act 1995 and for related purposes. A bill for an act to provide for a limited exemption from the carbon charge component of levy imposed on the import of synthetic greenhouse gases by the Ozone Protection and Synthetic Greenhouse Gas Import Levy Act 1995 and for related purposes. A bill for an act to amend the Ozone Protection and Synthetic Greenhouse Gas Manufacture Levy Act 1995 and for related purposes. A bill for an act to impose a levy on true up shortfalls under the Clean Energy Legislation Carbon Tax Repeal Act 2013, so far as that levy is neither a duty of customs nor a duty of excise. A bill for an act to impose a levy on true up shortfalls under the Clean Energy Legislation Carbon Tax Repeal Act 2013, so far as that levy is a duty of excise. A bill for an act to abolish the Climate Change Authority and for other purposes. A bill for an act to amend the Customs Tariff Act 1995 and for related purposes. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to excise tariffs and for related purposes. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and for related purposes. A bill for an act to abolish the Clean Energy Finance Corporation and for other purposes. I have received messages from Her Excellency the Governor-General recommending, in accordance with Section 56 of the Constitution, appropriations for the purposes of the Clean Energy Legislation Carbon Tax Repeal Bill of 2013. The Ozone Protection and Synthetic Greenhouse Gas Import Levy Transitional Provisions Bill 2013, the Climate Change Authority of Abolition Bill of 2013 and the Clean Energy Finance Corporation Abolition Bill of 2013. Prior to my moving to consider the bill in detail, or the House to consider the bill in detail, I have a statement I wish to read to the House concerning the uh, amendments circulated by the opposition earlier this morning. My attention has been drawn to the detailed pay stage amendments circulated by the Honourable Member for Port Adelaide. I am concerned about the amendments on two grounds. First, it is arguable that they could in fact constitute the initiation of a proposal to impose or increase or change the scope of a charge contrary to Standing Order 179A. The second area of my concern is that paragraph 179B of the Standing Orders provides that only a minister may move an amendment to a proposal which increases or extends the scope of a proposed charge beyond the total already existing under an Act of Parliament. If I understand it correctly, there may be some doubt as to the impact of bringing forward the date of commencement of the Emissions Trading Scheme, which is the substance of the Honourable Member's amendments. On one view, the amendment should be allowed to stand, as it would be, I could be argued, the expected and likely effect of the calculation of the proposed liability could, may not exceed that set by the current law. On the other hand, because there could in fact be no certainty, it would be legally possible that the amendments would have the effect that the liability would exceed that provided under the current law. In my view, the uncertainty is too great to allow the amendments to proceed. Accordingly, I am not prepared to allow them to be moved in their present form. Accordingly, I call the uh, manager of opposition, opposition business. Madam Speaker, these amendments were circulated this morning. It is an extraordinary circumstance if we wait until the very moment that amendments are about to be moved before you raise with honourable members issues which could have been resolved by redrafting. We have a circumstance where there is a clear political debate which is significant that has been happening across the country and that should be brought to a head within this chamber, and to have a circumstance where it is brought to our attention for the first time at the moment it's about to be moved here on the floor of the chamber does a great disservice to the conduct of proper debate within this chamber. And I would ask you, Madam Speaker, given the circumstances of uh, the, the numbers within the debate, 
to have a circumstance where it isn't even allowed to be put and we're not even allowed to have the argument brings the co concepts of secrecy to an extraordinary level. And I do ask you, I do ask you, Madam Speaker, to reconsider, in particular, considering the timing of when this has been brought to the attention of the opposition. Here, here. Um, I call the leader of the house. Madam Speaker, on indulgence, I understand that there is no motion before the chair with respect to your ruling. But can I just say very briefly, uh, the Senate and the House of Representatives have long had a different view about these matters, and you'd be familiar with both, having served in both. In the House of Representatives, it's very clear uh, that the House cannot capably consider uh, the amendment as suggested by the member for Port Adelaide uh, with respect to revenue or appropriation matters. Only such amendments can be moved by a minister from the executive government. We had this debate several times in the last parliament uh, with the Leader of the House and the Manager of the Opposition Business on different sides of the argument. Uh, speaker Jenkins, uh, Speakers Burke and other speakers have all ruled uh, in exactly the same way as you have ruled today. That is the precedent. Uh, it's not, unfortunately not capable for the House to consider this amendment, but as you pointed out in your ruling, as you pointed out in your ruling, you said that you wouldn't allow this amendment to go forward in its current form. If the member for Adelaide is capable of amending his amendment, changing his amendment, and resubmitting re it, he might, you might well make a different ruling. Uh, before I call uh, the uh, member for Greenland, I would say there is precedent for such a ruling. Indeed, when one was made on Thursday, the 2nd of June, 2011, and it did in fact involve myself and the bill that I had brought into this House, which in fact had had a second reading and was in line basically with the sort of situation we are in now. On that occasion, then Attorney General, Mr McClelland, made it quite clear in his submission um, to that uh, outlining the reasons why, uh, section, why Standing Order 179 should apply. Uh, his final words were these. The message comes from the Governor-General, similarly in the case of Justice Kirby, referred to the, the discussion in the issue in Lane's commentary on the Australian Constitution in 1997. He was referring above to Pape's case and concluded that the initiative for proposed appropriations belongs to the executive government in accordance with section 56 of the Constitution. Again, the will of the executive being referred to in the message of the Governor-General, with the Governor-General acting on the advice of the executive of the day. So with respect, Mr Speaker, your ruling is entirely consistent with the standing orders, but more than that, it is entirely consistent with our constitutional heritage, and I am upholding that ruling. I call the member for Greenland. To, to the point of order, Madam yep. Speaker, to uh, goes to your ruling, which, with respect, I don't think is correct in this instance. Um, at that uh, time, you would be very familiar with uh, the proposition to which the, attorney, the then Attorney General responded, because it was indeed the member for McKellar mm. who was trying to do exactly what, you're trying to uh, do. what you are now saying. What you are now saying was wrong. Mm. You will recall at that time that the member for McKellar and other members of the now government benches voted voted that it was it was um, competent for uh, that amendment to proceed. You'd also be aware, uh, Madam Speaker, of the process of the way that amendments are drafted and put before this chamber. The amendments are done by the opposition in consultation with the clerks. It is at that point in time that it is determined upon the best proper apolitical advice on whether those amendments are in order. In this case, in spite of the fact that this legislation is being rammed through with a gag motion, with very little debate, which is why it's before, with, which is why it's before, which is why the amendments were put before the chamber today and are being voted upon just hours after, without proper consideration. In spite of that fact, in spite of that fact, the uh, shadow minister has put forward these amendments in the usual way, having got <coughs> approval of the clerks, which is when when that occurs. That occurs for very practical reasons, Madam Speaker. Uh, I, 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 I've heard your point. As you'd be aware. Well, I, I've have heard further point. points, Madam Speaker. Uh, well, I have further I, points. The, uh, if the, I the dissertation is a bit lengthy. 
and I, I have pursue them, please. and I have a response to what you put well, forward. Well, if I could pursue all of them, <laughs> if and you then... can do it in a very short space of time, you may proceed. I'll do my best, Madam Speaker. And if your best isn't good enough, you may resume your seat. Well, we're, we're, and, and, and then we'll have another process, Madam Speaker. That will take 25 minutes. Indeed. So, in terms of uh, in, in, in terms of uh, in terms of the processes, also, uh, your ruling would suggest that um, you are making a determination that the ETS effectively coming in the floating price earlier um, than what is envisaged. This is now debate, and that is not a No, it order. goes to your rule. No, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm Madam sorry. Speaker. You I are am making... ruling you out of order. Madam Kindly Speaker. Resume your, resume your seat. And I will address the matters you've already raised. What is the further point? Would you refer to the standing order you are relying upon? Very standing order number what? I am referring very specifically to your ruling. You have made your ruling Makes a determination and you are now on debating what the price, my ruling. There are other the, forms of the house on that. what the price will be. That I is the making, decision that you have made on the I basis not that the revenues would make a difference. I am not accepting my ruling. The member will resume his seat. Well, the member will resume his seat. Would you prefer to leave the chamber? Then resume your seat. Resume your seat. Now, very simply. The member has raised the question that the clerks had prepared these amendments for them. Likewise, likewise, indeed it is what he said. Indeed, a similar there will be silence. Indeed, a similar situation arose with the question of my bill, to which the member has referred. It too was prepared by the clerks and it had had a second reading and this point was raised at the point of where we were to proceed further. So when uh, um, this issue is now being dealt with, I did speak to the, uh, the member for Port Adelaide as, as soon as I could possibly do so because I did not take this question lightly. I did do quite a deal of research into the question because of my concern about it. I haven't finished yet. Thank you very much. The point, the point is that these are in line with the, with the previous uh, ruling of the Speaker. Uh, the member for Graindler said that we voted against it, which we did, but I accept the ruling of the Speaker as being appropriate. Accordingly, manager of government business, of opposition business, I'm sorry. As you'd appreciate, we don't have a written copy of, of the ruling. Uh, point of order one, under Standing Order 179C. I'm trying to work out how the amendment that reduces the current pricing arrangements can be seen as an amendment which would increase the scope of the charge proposed beyond, no, beyond, not beyond the bill before us, but beyond any act of parliament. Now, it's the act of parliament that's the reference point, and I'm trying to work out how other than by making what might be a political point across the chamber, you've reached a conclusion about price. Yes. I'm relying on section 179A and B, only a minister may initiate a proposal. A proposal is a proposal and your amendment is a proposal. And it is a proposal to increase, and it's covered by the words impose, increase or decrease a tax or duty or charge, change the scope of any charge. I call the Honourable the uh, Minister for the Environment. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. If it assists the House on indulgence, I would refer to page 420 of House of Representatives practice. I think that that provides an important guide as to the interpretation here, uh, not just of the standing orders but also of the Constitution. Page 420 says, and I quote, it is a long established and strictly observed rule which expresses a principle of the highest constitutional importance that no public charge can be incurred except, except on the initiative of the executive government. On every reading, on every reading, what this set of amendments attempts to do is to bring forward 
a variation on a public charge and to change its the scope. Minister, the minister no will doubt receive, or debate. The minister will resume his seat for a moment. I call the manager of opposition business. Madam Speaker, would you kindly table your ruling so that we can have a look at exactly what you've got there? Well, um, I may if I wish, but I've made the ruling and I've stated it. Oh, no, no. And, um, I've made the ruling. I see no reason why. Uh, yes, we can have a. Yes, well, look, I can have a copy made subsequently and made available to you. The problem is, as you would appreciate, the debate that we have to consider whether or not we now have needs to happen within the moment. Uh, it's now well, some I... time since yes. you first said it. We still don't have a copy of it, notwithstanding that the amendments were circulated this morning. Uh, I don't want to be in a situation where we have no choice but to move a further resolution. Well, I would put it to the member that that is a proper proceeding of the House if the, if the member wishes to do so. But I think this is a very important constitutional point. Uh, which was made very ably by Attorney General McClelland in the previous government, and I believe, I believe, I believe this, the ruling that I have made as a considered ruling, and one of importance and upholding a previous ruling, should stand. Uh, the member, it is quite uh, open to the uh, manager of government business to take another action if he wishes to do so, and I invite him to do so forthwith if he wishes to. Madam Speaker, I move that your ruling be dissented from. Yeah. 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 Madam Speaker, it is extraordinary for us now to be having a conversation about whether or not the parliament is allowed to debate what has been debated throughout Australia for so long. It is extraordinary, after all the conversation that has happened up until now about the shift to emissions trading and making sure that there actually is a limit on pollution rather than pollution being unlimited, that we are now being told in this new parliament that's a conversation you're not allowed to have. That in this parliament those amendments, not simply the debate gets gagged, which we thought was bad enough. Your ruling, Madam Speaker, isn't that the debate gets gagged, it's that the debate is not allowed to occur at all. Yeah. At all. And if there is a duty of the Speaker in this House, it has to begin with the concept of facilitating debate. And if, it is, and if there is a view, if there is a view, Madam Speaker, that you think amendments that have been circulated are in fact contrary to standing orders and you know full well that the debate has already had a gag put on it by the government. You know full well, Madam Speaker, that there might not be time for redrafting to occur unless you provide the opposition with notice. Yeah, yeah. What would possess you, Madam Speaker, in those circumstances to wait until the commencement of the debate before we were told? Because in doing so, Madam Speaker, you guarantee that the debate cannot occur on the floor of this chamber. You actually guarantee the opposite of what is generally understood to be the role of the Speaker. You guarantee not that a, that a vigorous debate will occur, but you guarantee that a vigorous debate will be ruled out. I've been critical of the Leader of the House for the gag resolutions that he's brought down in this chamber. I've been critical of the Leader of the House for the idea that debate on amendments would be limited to an hour. It never occurred to anyone on this side of the chamber that there would be an attempt from the Speaker that to view one hour of debate as too long and to say the figure of one hour needed to be reduced to zero for the purpose of discussing these amendments. Madam Speaker, it should be within the remit of this parliament to be able to debate the issues which have been discussed and flagged well in advance. And with the knowledge of the one hour deadline already applying to the conduct of this debate, the, the precedent which you quote, Madam Speaker, I have to say is a real stretch. Because in that debate, even though, as you say, Madam Speaker, it wasn't brought to your attention until the beginning of the proceedings, mm. I hazard a guess that there wasn't a one-hour limit on consideration in detail that day. 
I hazard a guess that we don't have those circumstances. But, Madam Speaker, most importantly, to think that you would refer to Standing Order 179 A and B as though Part C just isn't on the page. It's just not there. And the reason, Madam Speaker, that you won't refer to Standing Order 179 C is because it would allow the amendment. That's exactly why we actually have a circumstance, Madam Speaker, where you are consciously and knowingly ignoring one of the standing orders. If A and B were the only standing orders which were there, the decision you have made, the ruling that you have made, would at least be arguable, notwithstanding the fact that the process you have followed restricts debate in an unacceptable way in this chamber. But to ignore the words of 179C, a member who is not a minister may move an amendment to the proposal which does not increase or extend the scope of the charge proposed beyond the total already existing under any Act of Parliament. The amendments which are to be before the House and which have been circulated by the member for Port Adelaide fall entirely within that standing order. Entirely within. And, Madam Speaker, you have put the House in a situation where, where we don't get a written copy of your ruling, but which I think would be more helpful, Madam Speaker, would be if you were provided with a written copy of the standing orders. That's right. Because a written copy of the standing orders, I believe, would have led you to a circumstance where no reasonable person could have made the ruling that you just made. It cannot be justified under the standing orders. And it certainly can't be justified if you have the slightest part of belief in having debate in this chamber. I must say, Madam Speaker, it is the first time I can recall when I have had a speaker refer to the government's position using the pronoun we. That was an extraordinary part of the way you sought to explain yourself to the chamber. If there was ever, if it wasn't enough, for us to have a speaker physically brought to the chair by a Prime Minister and a Leader of the House, to then have rulings that are governed by the term we, referring to yourself and the government as one, changes the role of your chair entirely, changes the role of the high office you occupy entirely. Madam Speaker, we were told that you would be an independent speaker. This ruling is entirely inconsistent with that. The timing you have given on this ruling is entirely inconsistent with that. The lack of notice you have given to the opposition is entirely, entirely inconsistent with that. We were told that things would be transparent. Well, I've got to say you've delivered on that one, because this is entirely transparent. Because what these amendments would have done what these amendments would have done, Madam Speaker, is force those opposite to actually vote squarely on the question of the tax alone and change it to a circumstance where you could get rid of the tax, but pollution could not be unlimited. That was exactly what these amendments did, exactly what they did. And now government members, because of you shielding them from that question, get to avoid that. That is a reflection on the chair and I ask you to withdraw. It's a dissent motion, Madam Speaker. I have moved the resolution because I think your ruling is wrong. I'm a, I do not resile from that for one moment. I'm not referring to that. I call the Leader of the House. Point of order, Madam Speaker. I think the point that the Speaker is making is not that you uh, shouldn't be able to dissent from her ruling, but during that, I'll be quiet, you buffoon, disorderly conduct. Check it out. Look it up. The point is, that in your dissent motion, the member's dissent motion, he's perfectly entitled to disagree with the speaker's ruling, but he's not allowed to reflect personally on the speaker and is... her impartiality. And that is what the speaker is asking you to withdraw. And I would ask you to do so on behalf of the speaker. I call the, the reflection on uh, the chair that I was made. Drawn. Thank you. Madam I call speaker. again the member. Madam Speaker, Manager of opposition business. on saying that they'd be transparent, they have delivered in spades. Because we have, we have an, a situation now where all of this means one very simple thing. The government get to avoid a vote. 
The government get to avoid a, a vote, and this parliament avoids a debate. And what does it say about how they feel about the strength of their arguments when this is where we end up? Madam Speaker, had there been early notice, I have no doubt this would have been able to be rectified. To your satisfaction, I have no, no doubt, no doubt there would have been a way. And, and notwithstanding, notwithstanding the interjections opposite and notwithstanding the, the shaking of your head, Madam Speaker, when I said that this could be rectified, uh, you did refer to the opportunity for things to be redrafted. And I take those words of yours in good faith. And in turn, I, I acknowledge that the timing of this makes it impossible. Makes it impossible. The timing of it, Madam Speaker, the manner of delivery, the ruling itself, the ignoring of standing order C within the very section you chose to refer to, has put this parliament in a situation where debate is being silenced and amendments, which I have to say, it's not like the amendments were about to form a majority of the chamber. It's not like that was about to happen. It's not like they needed to be running high and scared from the outcome. It should be reasonable that there's never a culture of secrecy here on the floor of the chamber. Yeah. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker uh, your rulings when you ask for things to be withdrawn, when you make different rulings, when you've asked us to quieten down at different points, when you get on your feet, we will respect your role. But, Madam Speaker, you need to abide by the standing orders. And, and on this am. occasion, and you I have would not. ask that again as a reflection on the chair, and I'd ask you to withdraw. Ma um, may I speak to the point of order? You can disagree with my ruling, but you cannot say that I'm not abiding by the standing orders. M Madam Speaker, then how can I move dissent? The, the, basis, the basis of a dissent. I'm not presuming any ill will on your part, Madam Thank Speaker. You. I'm not presuming any ill will, but I don't know how I can move dissent without saying that. You were wrong on the standing orders. I, I don't know how else a dissent are, motion can correct, take effect. You are correct to disagree with my ruling on the standing orders. That is not to say uh, at large that I don't comply with the standing orders. That is a reflection on the chair. So, and at the end there. Uh, Madam Speaker, your ruling must be dissented from. I presume your time on the is out. It has elapsed. I call the honourable member for Port Adelaide. Well, <coughs> thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, and Madam Speaker, uh, since your ruling, I've had the opportunity. I call the leader of government business. Is the member for Port Adelaide seconding the motion? Otherwise, well, he needs to say so. Is the member seconding the motion? I second the motion. Is no, I'm speaking. I'm speaking. Is, uh, is thank the you, member Madam, for Adelaide? Thank you, Madam Speaker. And, since your ruling, I've been able to read your written statement, uh, and as uh, the manager of opposition business pointed out, the statement appears to rely particularly on uh, Standing Order 179A and 179B, as I uh, but said. doesn't refer expressly to the provisions in 179C, which provides that a member who is not a minister, in this case myself, may move an amendment to the proposal which does not increase or extend the scope of the charge beyond the total already existing under any Act of Parliament. So what is the, que what is the question uh, here at issue? The question here at issue uh, is what, what is the effect of the amendment moved by me uh, on the existing Act that is proposed to be amended or repealed by the government? Well, the effect of the amendment proposed by me is to change the way in which carbon pricing works in the financial year 2014 to 2015. To change the way. So what is, what is the way in which it, it is changed? Well, the way in which it is changed is it moves from the fixed price that is currently set out in the legislation, described by the opposition over a long period of time as the carbon tax, to a floating price. So it moves to an emissions trading scheme. Uh, it doesn't bring in any, any additional liable entities. Uh, so the only way there is no change to scope. The only way 179C, the only the only way in which 179C uh, can be uh, activated, is an argument that it increases the charge. The charge currently set, I think, at $24.15 per tonne. Now that is a judgment to be made, and it is a judgment that you have made, Speaker, from which uh, we greatly dissent. Uh, this is not a new set of amendments. These are the set of amendments that we released when in government 
as an exposure draft uh, before the September 7 election. Uh, we released it. Uh, it was subject to public consultation, and it was released with very clear statements from the Prime Minister, uh, then Kevin Rudd, from the then yeah. Treasurer Bowen, and from myself about Treasury's advice on the impact in 2014-15 of moving from a fixed price, the carbon tax, as the now government like to call it, to a floating price under an emissions trading scheme. And Treasury's advice was very clear. Treasury's advice uh, was that the price would move from around $24 to around 6 that it would be reduced by 75 per cent. Uh, and it seems to me, although uh, the now government refuses to release any information about the basis of their current policy, won't release the incoming brief, which Alan Kohler tells us this morning uh, apparently indicates that direct action, their policy, will cost $10 billion per year. Well, release your incoming brief and we'll know whether or not it's false. Uh, the only thing we have to go on is, is articles from Alan Kohler. So they won't release the incoming brief. I call the Leader of the House. Madam Speaker, the member for Port Adelaide needs to be arguing why your ruling should be dissented from. He shouldn't be arguing about the substance of the amendment or the bill. He's had that opportunity and, in consideration in detail, can have the opportunity again. Uh, the uh, Leader of the House makes a very valid point, and I would ask the member to Thank you, Madam to Speaker. the substance the, the, of okay, the motion. The point I was trying to make, Madam Speaker, with the greatest of respect, was that what your ruling has done is sought to make an assessment about the financial impact mm -hmm. of the change in 2014-15. Mm -hmm. uh, no, not the scope, the financial impact, because there is no change to scope, there is no change to the liable entities, there is, there is no change. What, what is changed is the way in which the price per tonne is fixed. And Treasury's Since advice was that that price would reduce by three quarters. You are now not debating the question as to why my ruling should be well, dissented Well, I am directly from. debating it because, you, no, you're because not. Madam Speaker, with arguments. the greatest of respect, your ruling makes an assessment that a change from a fixed price to a floating price in 2014-15 will increase that price. If that, you read well, that is the only way in which, in which Standing Order 179C cannot apply and cannot cover my I amendments. I call the Leader of the House. Madam Speaker, with, with the greatest of respect, the dissent motion is about your ruling mm -hmm. that the House is not capable of considering this amendment. You have made no assessment at all about the financial implications of any of these matters. And to, uh, to, accuse, you of doing so, to accuse you of doing so is quite out of order. You need to study exactly what you are dissenting from, uh, and then you will be in a position to argue it more successfully. I simply ask the member the member to continue to it's based address on an assessment the that the impact of our amendments would increase the charge. The only advice in the public realm is that it would reduce it by the 75 The member's time has expired. I call the leader of the house. Oh, and the question is that the uh, uh, the motion moved by the manager of opposition business that there be a dissent from the uh, from the speaker's ruling be agreed to. I call the Leader of the House. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I do not wish to detain the House uh, at great length because the debate management motion that I had passed uh, earlier in the debate uh, provides for the consideration of detail to begin uh, once the second reading has been carried and you have stated that the House will now consider the bill in detail. So the opposition is, in fact, uh, denying themselves the opportunity to consider the bills in detail by moving this dissent motion in your ruling. Very simply, Madam Speaker, uh, the ruling that you have made is entirely consistent with every other ruling of a similar nature to do with the capabilities of the House to amend or change legislation introduced by the executive. It is very clear in section 179A of the standing orders, only a minister may initiate a proposal to impose, increase or decrease a tax or duty or change the scope of any charge. It's very straightforward, Madam Speaker. It's there because the House of Representatives, uh, the government needs to initiate money bills in the House of Representatives. And any amendment to try and change money bills uh, is outside the capability of anybody other than someone from the executive. Now, the opposition knows this, Madam Speaker, because we had these debates quite routinely when we were in opposition. Uh, before September the 7th. The opposition knows this, uh, and this dissent motion, as along with their amendment, 
uh, is a try on. It would be quite unprecedented for you to have ruled in any other way than that the House is incapable of uh, dealing with this particular amendment. And you did very generously, I thought, give the opposition the opportunity to try and move another amendment in consideration in detail, which didn't offend the standing orders or the Constitution of Australia, which makes it clear that only the executive can initiate money bills. Now, for the benefit of the House and for many of the new members, why is that so? It is so because the history of the Westminster tradition is one of civil war in the 17th century, which caused such great ructions in Britain that the parliament that replaced the civil war only allowed the executive to initiate money bills to make it clear between the Crown and the Parliament who was responsible for what. Now, we have inherited that Westminster system, and therefore it would be quite improper for you to have ruled in any other way than that the opposition cannot initiate changes to a money bill. Now, the member for Port Adelaide made it very clear that that is exactly what his amendment seeks to do. And I quote him. He said the that the, his amendment changes the way the charge is collected and changes the timing of the act. In other words, it extends the scope of the bill. That is your quotation. That is your quotation from your speech. In other words, Madam Speaker, the opposition and the matter of opposition business in the House did it as well throughout his contribution, kept repeating the fact that this amendment, this amendment extended the scope. Uh, and, and that he believes that we're capable of doing that in the House of Representatives today on a motion initiated by the opposition. Now, when we were in opposition, it was very clear that only the executive could initiate such changes, and it is very important that the House upholds uh, the standards that have been set over the course of our parliament. I could go on at great length, Madam Speaker, but I want to get on with the consideration of de in detail, and as a consequence, I move that the question be put. The question before the House is that the question be put. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. I think the ayes have it. Is a division required? Is a division required? Yes. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The eyes will pass to the right of the chair and the nose to the left of the chair. I appoint the same tellers as before.
The result of the division is ayes 82, noes 51. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question now before the chair is the motion moved by the member for Watson of dissent in the speaker's ruling. All those, the question is that the motion be agreed to. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. I think the noes have it. No. Is a division required? Ring the bells for one minute. Anybody who has come into the chamber after the previous division would please advise the tellers of their coming into the chamber. I'm sorry, there are still three seconds left. If there is somebody outside the door, they may be admitted. I repeat what I said earlier. If somebody has come into the chamber who wasn't in the chamber previously, would they come forward and advise the teller? The tellers. Tellers remain the same tellers as previously.
The result of the division is eyes 49, nose 85. The question is therefore negative. The House will now consider the bills in detail in accordance with the resolution agreed on on the 18th of November. The bills will be taken together. The question is that the bills be agreed to. I call the Leader of the House. Madam Speaker, on a point of order understanding orders 91 and 92, uh, on social media, the members from Morton and McEwen have been reflecting uh, on the chair, uh, the impartiality of the chair. I'd point out to you that the member from McEwen is the second deputy speaker. Uh, I point out that what I regard as disorderly conduct. Uh, so the member for Jager Jager thinks that just reflecting on the member from McEwen is the same as reflecting on the speaker, does she? The member from, the member from McEwen has a higher level of responsibility. On social media, on Twitter, during the division and during the debate, the members from McEwen and Mitchell were reflecting quite improperly on the chair and your impartiality. Uh, as the speaker, I'd ask you to consider whether this is disorderly conduct and what action you might like to take. I don't wish to take it to another level of privilege, for example. It might well be because of the inexperience of the members and their lack of knowledge of the opposition. I would certainly ask the manager of opposition business in the House to counsel members about reflecting on the impartiality of the chair. But I ask you to consider it rather than acting immediately, unless you choose to act immediately, and uh, whether it has been a reflection on the chair and therefore is disorderly conduct and how you might like to deal with it. I thank the uh, Leader of the House for his uh, um, point of order. I would say that we have decided in this chamber that we do allow electronic media to be used uh, and that it is in the uh, responsibility of individual members to abide by the standing orders in the way in which they use uh, that electronic media and social media. I would be disappointed if the second deputy speaker had so reflected. Uh, I would find that um, if others have so reflected, then they might like to cons consider their actions themselves. But I would simply remind you that the use of electronic media, the same rules pertain as to speaking in the House. Uh, Leader of the House, I call Madam Speaker, uh, I would point you to precedence in the, these matters before. The member for Canning. Uh, was involved in a precedent in previous parliaments involving Speaker Andrew was asked to apologise to the Speaker in the House uh, under threat of uh, more serious action being taken. You might like to take on reflecting on the Speaker, which is not allowed to be done in the chamber on, and on Twitter. You're not allowed to do it. You're not allowed to do it. I simply point out that precedent to you, Madam Speaker. I thank the uh, Leader of the House and call the Manager of Opposition Business. Uh, on the uh, same point of order, I take it? Madam, Madam Speaker, just uh, to, the, to the point of order on indulgence, or however I may no, say No, we don't do points of order on indulgence. Are you speaking to the point of order or not? Uh, point of order. Uh, Madam on Speaker, that point of order was raised? Yeah, for the point of order that was raised. Uh, the, the issue of digital media within the chamber is one that I know has been raised with you in the interviews that you did shortly after becoming Speaker. Uh, and if, if you do uh, wish to provide clarity at some point on how it's to be used within the chamber, then, then the opposition would, would welcome that clarity. I, well, I've actually just done that. I've said yeah, that it, it appeared to be different to what I recalled from the Sky News interviews. So, but uh, it is if, still used in, in, in the chamber. Okay. Thank you, madam. There is no intention of not having it used in the chamber, but you do have to abide by the standing orders uh, in its use. So I think. Uh, no, there's no indulgence. I'm sorry, no, certainly not indulgence. What point of order? On your the I've just, point I've just raised by the leader of the opposition. No, this is not uh, a leader. debate on the issue. We've just ruled on the point of order. The manager of opposition business asked me how it was to be used, and I've answered the question. Well, well that'll be new. The member for Morton uh, has 
speaking to what? Uh, to the uh, reflection on the chair, and I, I do wish to apologise for the retweet that I put. And uh, I did make a line ball call, and I, I would certainly refrain from so doing in the future. And I would make every endeavour to assist the House wherever possible, Madam Speaker. Is that an apology as well? If you so require, Madam Speaker. I thank you. Take you for it as apology. you may. Thank you. Thank you. I thank the honourable member for Morton.